Professor Berkowitz has been able to join us today, and through the grace of my colleague, Fred Cartier, it's possible for us to tape this opening session. Uh, for that reason, Professor Berkowitz will be a little bit less mobile than he ordinarily is to make sure that he stays in the frame. Uh, he has been working in a number of years here at Bard College within the overall field of human rights and has also founded the Hannah Arendt Center here. And of course, Hannah Arendt's work is one of the principal elements within his paper. Uh, Roger combines a philosophical acumen with a concern for how it is that it is possible for us to develop more humanly uh, within a postmodern environment. What we thought uh, the best approach would be to this initial session is not to assume that everyone will have been able to read the whole of his paper in detail, although we fervently hope quite a lot of the students have done so. We did distribute the paper in advance on the internet for that purpose. However, ordinarily uh, within this course, uh, we at Bard would have one or two students respond in writing to a given paper, and then that would open the discussion. Since this is our first session and a joint session, we're not able to follow that classic form of the course. What I'll be doing by way of logistics when Professor Berkowitz is finished is assign Bard students prospectively for their response to papers as they come up in the syllabus. I'll also at that time explain matters of the calendar for the Bard students for whom a great deal of this will be news because it was news to us until a few years ago, uh, until a few weeks ago as concerned planning. So we're delighted that Professor Berkowitz is able to join us. Uh, what we have asked him to do is to present uh, the main lines of his paper to us, uh, but then engage with you in question answer, objection answer, debate, complete harmony, uh, whatever it is that emerges from the discussion. Uh, for the reason that we are taping the session, you will find that Professor Berkowitz will be repeating your question. Uh, he is Socratic, but that's not the reason for which he'll be doing it. Uh, he'll be doing it uh, so that your question will also be on the tape. Professor Berkowitz. Um, thank you all, and, and thank you to Bruce um, and Jack and, and Robert Tully for this invitation. Um, it's, uh, it's a real pleasure for me to speak uh, in front of this uh, mixed audience um, of Bard students and West Point cadets. Uh, and on a topic that I uh, admit that I didn't know much about before I was asked to, to think about it, um, but one that I've uh, come to find quite fascinating. Um, my paper is titled, maybe provocatively, maybe not for some of you, Should We Justify War? Uh, I say that because for many people it's, it's sort of uh, an obvious answer to that question, which is yes, we should try and uh, make war as just as possible. We should seek to justify it. I approach the question from two different ways. Uh, one is to think about the difference between justice and justification. Um, this is, is part of the work I've been doing for years to, 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 to look at how the effort to justify something, to give it reasons and rules and to set it under criteria, um, normalizes it and brings it down to earth and proceduralizes it and legalizes it and in a way takes away from something the concern of justice, the more absolute higher ethical idea. And then the second approach is to change, is to, is to move from the question of should we do something to what is it? So we have a tendency in this country to say 
should we have a death penalty? Or should we have abortion? Um, or should we have war? Uh, and we often forget the question, well, what is the death penalty? What is death? What is a penalty? What is abortion? What is war? And so I'm going to begin today just briefly how I begin the paper by asking what is war? Um, and there's many different ways to answer that question, but Heraclitus, the Greek philosopher, says uh, in a very famous passage that war is the father of all things. He says also that war is what is most common. And he says that justice is strife or war. And he says that all things come to life in strife. And all things are steered by lightning and fire. For Heraclitus, justice is the child, the daughter, in Greek mythology, DK, of war. Now this could shock us, or we may just simply think it's unimportant. Um, but it seems, in any case, somewhat irrelevant and dark. And yet, we understand more modern ideas, such as Patrick Henry's statement, give me liberty or give me death. We understand Achilles, who chooses to live a glorious and short life rather than a long and uh, boring life. One of, the, uh, one of the people that I sought guidance for in thinking about this question of just war and war is, uh, is Simone Weil. Simone Weil is, uh, was a, a German, uh, born a German Jew, uh, uh, who then converted to Christianity and um, became uh, a, a leading thinker of, of, of theology uh, and, and also a social commentator. And in one of her great essays called The Poem of Force about Homer's Iliad, she says, quote, only he who has measured the dominion of force and knows how to respect it is capable of love and justice. I think what she means by that is that war teaches us misery. In her words, and this is her reading of the Iliad, war turns the people who fight it, turns the men who fight it into things in a way, in just utter battle. And the, and the confusion of war, they lose a certain sense, they're in danger of losing in a certain sense uh, a kind of humanity. And it's in that fighting of the war, as she understands it, and the danger of utter senselessness that we actually become most human. That we insist upon affirming things about ourselves that are just, that are true, that make us not things, but that are human, and that make life meaningful, and thus make the suffering of war, or life in a metaphorical sense, bearable. In other words, only those who know suffering deeply can readily believe in justice. Only those who fought in war, metaphorically or really, can really believe in justice, is what she's saying. Justice is that noble lie that humans invent to make our warlike and strife-like world meaningful. And so only one who really has experienced the warlike and strife-like world understand the need for meaningfulness and thus can see and imagine what justice is. When you think about it that way, to ask about justifying war seems quite strange. Because if war is what gives birth to justice, why should the child now judge the parent? Um, and uh, that is, in a sense, what is going on in just war theory. And it raises questions about it. Um, the very idea of justifying something is a modern idea. It's a scientific idea. It's saying that we need to provide reasons or rules for something. Um, in war, that's true as well. Just war theorists have a desire and a tendency to say that just war theory or just war thinking goes back for, gener you know, for, for centuries and even millennia, and yet that's not really right. Um, the Romans were really the first people who sought to speak of justifying war, 
But for the Romans, we justified war as a necessity. It was something that was necessary. As long as it was necessary, it was just. Um, Augustine uh, says, yeah, well, war is just when it brings peace, when it's fought to bring peace. But again, you can always say you're fighting to bring peace. It was more of a way to justify and say war is okay uh, against Christians who were arguing that it wasn't, at least as, uh, as, as, as I understand the Augustinian uh, approach to just war. Um, according to Hannah Arendt, and Hannah Arendt is, 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 is a, is a German-born Jewish American uh, thinker and um, political thinker who I uh, run the Hannah Arendt Center here, so she's someone I often turn to. She says that only in World War I do we really begin to uh, turn to justification of, law, of war in its modern sense. And the reason, she says, is that World War I was the first really, truly violent war, a war of utter destruction. And it makes the utilitarian justifications of the Romans uh, senseless, meaningless. How can you justify as necessary, as useful, a war that is so destructive? And in her reading of the 20th century, what RN says is that the only meaningful justification for war in the 20th century is freedom. There's nothing, when you look at the destructiveness, the deadliness of war, and you know, nuclear war is, I guess, the highest form of this, there's nothing that can justify war today. No utilitarian calculus, no you know, claim that it's for peace, except sort of an absolute belief in freedom. It's an absolute justification. And so this is the problematic that she sees just war theory is in in the 20th and now the 21st century, is that war has become so violent and so dehumanizing in, us, in a way that it is impossible to justify, such that the only justification for it is an absolute justification, something like freedom. And once you engage in absolute justifications, you can justify anything. And that becomes the problem with just war theory today. Um, just war theorists, when you begin to read them, um, aim at a couple things. They aim at making war human or humanitarian. They, make it, they want to tame war, sort of take off the rough edges. They want to legalize it and bureaucratize it. And what they find is that if you are fighting in the name of freedom and you're taming war and you're legalizing it and you're justifying it, you can pretty much justify almost anything. Right? We can justify uh, torture if we want to uh, in the war on terror, and we have. We can justify dropping nuclear bomb weapons and we have, and um, we can pretty much, there's not much that one could imagine is unjustifiable. I ask, you know, I ask you as a hypothetical question, you can come back to it in questions, is there anything in war that's unjustifiable today? Law, the way that we go about justifying law today is increasingly through rules. Uh, Experts manage war. A.L. Weitzman, uh, an Israeli who teaches in, 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 in London at Goldsmiths now, has a great phrase in which he says that um, lawyers go to war as much as soldiers do. No soldiers go to war today without lawyers in their team. That's his claim, at least in Israel. The military lawyers uh, are there to condition the battlefield. That means saying, who's allowed to be hit, who's not allowed to be hit. The international human rights law and international humanitarian law has now become part of the effort to create an ethical vocabulary for the legitimate killing of civilians. When can you kill civilians? When can you not? This is what uh, he and, and a Harvard professor named David Kennedy describe as the change from warfare to lawfare. And I think that that change is one of the most important changes of the last uh, 50 or 60 years. And so the question that my paper really, the two questions that my paper really asks is one, 
Does the effort to justify war yield more justice? Or does it set war free to be rationalized, legalized, and bureaucratized, and authorized, and made immune from moral judgment? And the second question is, should we justify war? This question is asked, not, is asked out of a worry that in demanding justifications for war, we turn war over to lawyers and technocrats and away from the soldiers. And in doing so, we normalize war and lose the human control over the judgment of what is and is not just in war. In a sense, what I'm saying is, does the discussion of and the effort to justify war forget the fact and the question of the justice of the war? Um, the paper uh, proceeds in a number of parts. Uh, the first part, um, and I was asked to sort of give a background uh, on, on just war theory to a certain extent uh, um, as, the, as the first paper in the series. The first part looks at just war theory as it emerged between two other opposing ideas, namely uh, pacifism and realism. Um, pacifism is this idea that war is always wrong, that we should never resort to violence. Uh, it has its, its origins, I'm sure, in many different cultures and places. Uh, in, in, there's, a, there's a Gandhian root, there's a Quaker root. We can think of um, the, the, the Christian exhortation of Christ to put your sword back into its place, for all who take the sword will pel perish by the sword. Um, Augustine, the, the great Christian church father, uh, in many cases was put in the position of defending war against um, a popular Christian thought that pacifism was the answer. And his, his response was to say that war is justified when it's fought with pacific ends. Be a peacemaker, he writes, even in war. Um, against pacifism, just war wants to justify war, say that there are times when war is just. Um, realism has its, maybe its greatest statement in the statement of Cicero, the formulation of Cicero, inter arma sine leges, right? Within arms or in battle, there are no laws. Um, and it stands for this idea that war is this extraordinary event that tends towards the utmost exertion of forces. There is no morality, there is no judgment of war except victory. Uh, this leads to, in modern times, the idea of total war. Um, the, the person who really did most to, to articulate this idea of total war was, interestingly enough, a, a, a novelist in Germany, a man named Ernst Jünger, who wrote a, a, an essay on, called Total Mobilization, uh, in which he argues that the essence of modern warfare is total mobilization, which means that in a democracy, when all citizens are part of the war effort, whether you're pro providing the factories or manning the factories or the farms, or you're voting for the people who continue the war, everyone, including the baby in the cradle, is now part of the war effort. And there is no meaningful way to distinguish um, amongst civilians and soldiers. And thus, um, we enter an age of total mo mobilization. Um, thus, there is no moral criteria with which we can judge war. Um, against that kind of realism, uh, just war theory tries to say, well, no. Um, we do need to make moral judgments. Um, we need to, in the words of Michael Walzer, who really is, I think, the most articulate and um, thoughtful uh, 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 writer and thinker about just war in our era, uh, we need to develop what he calls the moral reality of war, a phrase I have to say that is, I find quite moving, um, and uh, talk about war and justice. Um, we need to, in a sense, ask, who and what, who is responsible and when they're responsible. Against the boast of General uh, Sherman in the Civil War, who said war is cruelty and you cannot refine it, Walzer says, no, we, we have to try. We have to try and refine it. Um, 
And that is the, I think, the most noble and interesting and important effort of just war um, thinking. Um, so one way to think about just war is between pacifism and realism. And in between them to try and come up with this, to think through this idea of the moral reality of war. Another way to think about just war is by comparing it to and contrasting it to with law. And I've mentioned law a lot. I, I have a law degree. I, my background is in legal thinking and legal, legal philosophy. And, 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 I, and I'm sort of, I, I am fascinated with the way that um, just war theory both depends upon and runs away from its relation to law. Um, more and more today, uh, you can't talk about just war theory and the justification of war without uh, law. Uh, we have um, the League of Nations, we have the United Nations, we have the Kellogg-Briand Pact, we have the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, and tons, and the Geneva Convention. It's, 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 you can't, every time people start talking about the justification for war, you end up talking about laws and rules, the desire for objective standards. And yet Walzer and others are worried about this, and they want to avoid thinking about law as the core of just war theory for a number of reasons. One, laws uh, are often meaningless. They can be paper laws. Uh, you can make a law about anything. It doesn't mean it's going to be enforced. And for most of uh, the last 100 years, the international law has existed on paper and not in, in reality. Um, there's a lot of people who think that's slowly changing right now. Um, uh, and so for, for Walzer, we need to think about justice beyond the law. We need to engage in what he calls critical moral argument, and that gives voice to a common morality. Okay, well, how does one do that? Um, then you get into the nitty gritty. <coughs> Excuse me. Then, then you get into the question of, well, what is and what is not justified in war? And there are two basic uh, frameworks in which this is discussed in just war theory. Uh, one is called use ad bellum, which means the law about going to war, and use in bello, which means the law um, during or in or involved in the war. Uh, we speak in Latin. Um, why do we speak in Latin? Because we want to seem smart. No. Um, Interestingly enough, uh, you know, these words were used by Grotius and others in the, in, in the 16th and 17th centuries, but they only acquired these meanings of jus in bello and jus, jus ad bellum and jus in bello in this sort of sense that we use them today in the 19th century. Why did the 19th century folks use the Latin? Well, partly to make it seem traditional, to make it seem older. Um, and they want to suggest that these are, this is, these are two different ways of thinking about uh, the law of war. And the question is whether we can morally, one question is whether we can morally separate uh, these two ideas, jus ad bellum and jus in bello. I mean, the separation assumes that there's, one question is whether the war is a just war. Was it just for the United States to invade Afghanistan, Iraq, Vietnam, you know, World War II, Libya, etc.? And then it's another question of whether it's just to torture or to uh, bomb, uh, to, to use drones, right? But some people, in fact, most philosophers say, how can you separate those two questions? Because, you know, if, if, if you're fighting a just war and you use a drone, it might be different than if you're fighting an unjust war and you use a drone. Um, and yet, uh, it's very hard to it's very hard to unite these things because once you everyone thinks they're always fighting a just war, um, and uh, and if we want to have any kind of legal uh, and conceptual analysis, we have to keep them separate. And so almost everybody in the field says, look, these two these two distinctions of use ad bellum and use in bello don't work. They don't make sense as two distinct inquiries. They're one inquiry, but we use them anyway. Um, and that's uh, it's one of the interesting uh, questions of, of the field. Um, interestingly enough, jus ad bellum is largely, uh, increasingly irrelevant uh, in, in modern law, modern, modern um, international law. Um, 
for, for a number of reasons, but the main reason is that no one can argue, no one can actually come up with criteria to determine when it is, what is an unjust war. I mean, we all know, or all know, the United Nations and modern thinking assumes that all wars of aggression are unjust. But no war has ever been called a war of aggression by an international body. Uh, every war is always defined as a war of self-defense. Um, and, uh, and, and so the result is that um, we've never had a case brought in an international court uh, claiming a war of aggression. And there's no agreement on what it is. In fact, the, the, the statute of Rome, which sets up the International Criminal Court, says laws of aggression are illegal, but then leaves for future date the definition of what a law of aggression is, and that still has not been agreed to. Um, there's actually a lot of interesting questions about what is and is not a war of aggression, um, but I'm going to skip over that because it's, it's, it's for time's sake and you can read it in the paper. The much more um, pressing area of, 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 of international law of war today is use in bello, the law concerning what one can do in fighting a war. Um, this, is the, this is the focus that we have on individuals. We ask, did this particular soldier violate the law of war in doing X? Um, and this is where we turn war increasingly into a legal institution. And so before you fire on you know, those people in the street down there, you call it and say, I see these people, they're doing this, this is going on, do I have authority to fire? And there's a lawyer in that room saying yes or no. Uh, or at least um, in, in certain battles and in certain situations that have been described quite well in the literature by A.L. Weitzman and David Kennedy. Um, and this is the, 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 the transformation of, of law into, into warfare through uh, use in bello. Um, the, most, the most fundamental uh, uh, criteria or, or, or moral convention or legal convention of use in bello is called the discrimination convention. The Discrimination Convention says that we must distinguish um, between combatants and civilians. And there are two parts of it. One is called the moral equality of soldiers, and the other is civilian immunity. So the moral equality of soldiers comes from an older time when soldiers were aristocrats and knights and chivalrous. And the point was, we met on the battlefield, we fought, and then we went and had a beer. Um, you know, and we, we respected each other. We, 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 we fought as equals. And, um, e or, and, 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 and so this, the idea was, what well, doesn't matter what side you're fighting for, we are soldiers. We have a certain nobility and a certain, um, a, a certain kind of uh, respect for each other. This moral equality of war is under attack today. Um, there's a, I mean, Michael Walzer cites a, a wonderful uh, quotation from, from Dwight D. Eisenhower, who um, uh, was uh, refused to visit the captured German general von Armin uh, during the war. And in his memoirs, Eisenhower explains that while the law of war says that you're supposed to visit captured uh, generals, the general is supposed to visit the general, he says, it had the origins in the fact that mercenary soldiers of old had no real enmity toward their opponents. Both sides fought for love of a fight out of a sense of duty or more probably for money. The tradition that all professional soldiers are comrades in arms has persisted to this day. For me, World War II was far too personal a thing to entertain such feelings. Daily as it progressed, there grew within me the conviction that as never before, the forces that stood for human good and men's rights were confronted by a completely evil conspiracy with, with, with which no compromise could be tolerated. And so Eisenhower is used by many people today to say, look, there are good guys and bad guys, and we shouldn't treat bad soldiers as good soldiers. People who choose to fight for the Nazis or people who choose to fight for Al-Qaeda don't deserve the kind of moral equality of soldier status um, that traditionally uh, um, was, was given to soldiers. Um, 
Walzer, I think, gives an incredibly nuanced and interesting defense of the moral equality of soldiers uh, when he writes that um, every side will always think that, of course, they're the just side and they're the right side. And when you then say that war becomes a contest of good and evil and the soldiers are good or evil, what you do is you justify all sorts of and any sort of fighting. Um, and that if you're going to, in any way, maintain a moral reality of war and maintain a sense that there are limits to what you can do in war, the first presupposition you have to maintain is the moral equality of soldiers. Well, that's Walzer's point, and I think it's a powerful point. I think it's a very hard point to maintain today. And I think most uh, commentators find it simply unmaintainable. Uh, and, uh, and, one, and, and, and if that's the case, and if Walsh is right, it raises the question of whether we can continue in any meaningful way to talk about just war and moral, a moral reality of war. Um, the second uh, d main aspect of the Discrimination Convention is civilian immunity, um, which is simply very, which is that you're not, intent, you're not allowed to target civilians. The problem, of course, is that this distinction has been uh, blurred in many ways. Um, on the one hand, uh, when is a soldier a soldier? Right? There's that famous uh, reflection of George Orwell's uh, in his memoirs where he says that when he was in Spain, he had a soldier in his sights, and the soldier you know, took down his pants to take a pee, and he says, you know, I couldn't shoot him. A Nazi, you know, a Nazi soldier peeing is not a fascist. Um, you know, under the laws of war, he is, and can be shot. Um, under the laws of war, a soldier asleep can be shot. A soldier on leave can be killed. That's why uh, Osama bin Laden was um, fair game under the laws of war in his villa in. Uh, about, uh, in, in Pakistan. Um, hospitals are fair game if there are soldiers being treated inside, which is why you can't treat soldiers in a civilian hospital. Um, the United States Army Field Manual says uh, that civilians must not be made the object of attack directed exclusively at them. At the same time, the Field Manual permits the bombing of towns, villages, dwellings, or buildings when they are occupied by a combatant military force or when a force is passing through. Also allows the aerial bombing of towns until they surrender. Um, most recently, we have a number of issues with drones, which was in the paper today. President Obama today answered questions about drones for the first time um, when he was asked on Google about it, uh, in a Google chat room of sorts. Um, we now... Uh, we have justified, Harold Coe, the advisor to the State Department, has continued to justify the, uh, the targeted assassination of leaders, uh, things that often happen uh, um, far from the battlefield, when they're at weddings or funerals or with their families. This is legal under the law of war because these people, even though they're acting as civilians, are still soldiers. Um, <laughs> Added to this is the, is, this, is, the, is the idea of double intent, uh, which is a very complicated legal uh, way of saying that as long as you intend the main target of your act of war to be a military target, the fact that you knew you were also going to kill civilians doesn't matter. It won't make it a, 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 it won't make it a crime, right? And so, all all of this is to go to the sense that it's very hard to separate civilians and soldiers in modern war. In World War One, ten percent of the casualties were civilian. In World War Two, fifty percent of the casualties were civilian. In current United States conflicts in Afghanistan and Iraq, 90% of the casualties are civilian. 
This leads to the paradox that the more we codify international law to enforce the laws of war, the more civilians are killed. Now, Hannah Arendt, not usually read by just war theorists, but should be, says that civilian, that civilian immunity and the equality of soldiers, these core principles of the discrimination principles of modern laws of war, are simply anachronisms. We should, we should admit that they don't apply to war today. She says, you know, in the modern age, with the technologies and the way we fight, traditional war crimes are inevitable. You can't fight a war without them. And the only distinction between one side and the other is who wins and has victor's justice. In both sides, there will be war crimes committed. You, can't, you simply can't fight a war without it. And so what she says is, you go, this is the reason why we have stopped talking exclusively about war crimes, and more and more we talk not about war crimes, but about crimes against humanity. Because while war crimes are inevitable, crimes against humanity, she says, are still not inevitable, but extraordinary, and they are truly what must be stopped. Um, the bureaucratized mass genocidal or uh, killings or, 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 or ethnic cleansings of people. That, she says, is not necessary in war. That's not inevitable. And that should be criminal. But war crimes themselves, she says, it's almost, I mean, it's just a question of who wins who's going to enforce the war crimes. And, and you can look at this within the cases that come to the ICC, the International Criminal Court. There are four crimes that the ICC is allowed to hear. Genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, and aggression. Aggression, as I said, has never had an indictment, and it's not even defined. Um, and all, every single indictment that has been brought to the ICC has included crimes against humanities. What does this tell you? We've pretty much given up on prosecuting war crimes unless they are in conjunction with and combined with crimes against humanities. Um, there are small exceptions to this. I mean, in Abu Ghraib, we have prosecuted some very low-level people with very minor punishments for war crimes and violation of the torture conventions. But very, very uh, 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 mild and, and, and low-level punishments. In any case, this raises um, substantial questions about whether uh, crimes of war uh, are an anachronism today, whether the attempt to justify them through legal means and legalize them is actually um, making it easier to uh, um, blur those distinctions, because once because we get the lawyers involved, you can pretty much justify anything. Um, and, and then the question is, uh, should we, in a sense, pull back and say, look, let's stop trying to justify war. Because once we start justifying it, we can justify it. That's what just, just war theory has always been about justifying it, not about rejecting it. And instead, let's insist upon having the moral, the ethical question of what is just on individual cases and take it out of the, the legal framework. Uh, and so that's the question that, that I asked in the paper um, as a way of, of introducing this topic of, of, of just law, just war. And uh, I'm happy to, 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 to have a discussion or answer any questions about it. Uh, yes, in the um, back. You just mentioned um, there was a distinction between war crime and crime against humanity. What would that distinction be? Okay. Um, traditional war crimes are... are do, you, do you mind repeating that? Oh, yeah. The, the question was... I'm sorry. Thank you. The question was, um, what is the distinction between a war crime and a crime against humanity? 
And it's a, it's a good question because these things are, are, are somewhat fluid. But uh, war crime is, a, is an older category. Uh, and it includes uh, things like um, uh, targeting civilians, so violating civilian immunity. Um, it could include disproportionality, which is a response that's disproportionate to the threat that one, you know, uh, that one suffered. Um, and, and it's basically where you fight a war uh, using uh, means that uh, are seen to be unjust, unjustifiable. Um, and there are different criteria. Uh, crimes against humanity are a, are a new phenomena that emerge in the mid, um, largely in the mid uh, 20th century after the world, world War II. And there are different definitions for them. Uh, in international law, a crime against humanity has a very specific definition. But the, the essence of it is that it is uh, a crime against the human idea. Uh, it is a crime in which um, through bureaucratic, uh, mechanistic, legal means, you try and extinguish uh, a people a religious people, uh, a racial people, a national people from the face of the earth. In Crimes Against Humanity, you're not trying to win a war, right? You're trying to destroy and eradicate a people. Uh, and thus, you're actually trying to, re you're, 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 you're trying to reduce difference or plurality in the Arendtian sense. And, and, and you're, you're, you're actually opposing human difference. Um, genocide is the quintessential crime against humanity, but there could be ethnic cleansing, uh, rape of an entire you know, population, uh, and others can be crimes against humanity as well. They're not about winning a war, they're about destroying a people. Yeah. Sir, when you bring up your last uh, question about the paper, should we continue just by war would make everything more justifiable? Wouldn't the opposite be true that if we discontinue the act of trying to justify war, wouldn't it, there would be no necessary actions that would have to ever justify everything that would be permissible? Right. No one would be held accountable for they were right or wrong. Good. So the question is I, I, I raised the question in my paper should we continue to justify war? And the question is well, if we stop trying to justify war, uh, wouldn't that basically mean anything goes, right? That there's no limits. Um, and I think, that's, uh, I think that's an excellent question. And it requires, uh, it requires a, um, a somewhat, uh, it requires a long answer maybe. Um, and it comes back to this distinction I've been, I made a couple times between justification and justice. Um, but what I'm trying to suggest is that by insisting on the justification of war in the legal sense, what we're actually doing is not talking about justice. We're increasingly not talking about what Michael Walzer talks about <clears throat> as the moral reality of war. What are we talking about instead? We're talking about whether that bomb was intended for a civilian or not, and whether it violated you know, section 2235 of, of this manual or that manual. And what we end up with is the situation in which you have a helicopter with a lawyer in it and a soldier in it, and the lawyer is saying, you can hit this person, you can't hit this person, you can't hit this person. And they're not saying it because they're thinking about anything except what the rules are and how it's going to be seen in a court. Um, that's the direction that just war thinking is increasingly going in as warfare becomes lawfare. Or at least that's the, that's the argument that a number of people have made that I'm here um, repeating and finding persuasive. Uh, what would it mean to stop doing that? Well, it would, mean, it would not mean to stop talking about war, and it wouldn't mean to stop talking 